So hello, Daniel, and welcome to the show. Thank you for agreeing to come and chat with me today about your experiences, your writing, and the upcoming Hulu documentary, Stolen Youth, Inside the Cult at Sarah Lawrence. Would you like to start by introducing yourself to the listeners? Hi, I'm Daniel Barban Levin. Uh, Thank you so much for having me. I have been waiting to chat with you for a really long time. There's been some incredible reviews and feedback about your recent publication, Sloan in Wood 9, which is a memoir-based book. In what time frame did you write that that work? So uh, the book came out in September 2021. I started it in the summer of 2019 and wrote it in I think nine months that's pretty quick I think isn't it yeah yeah, it was you know um there's more context around the publication of that book but essentially you know I was uh, I had been living with the secret of having been in this group having been abused and having been the only person who left for like six years and then was contacted by reporters um, and started speaking publicly about it for the first time. And that created a lot of, um, once that story was published, there was a lot of pressure and interest uh, around it. And it became really clear to me that um, other people wanted to tell the story uh, without victims involved at all um uh, without survivors telling their own accounts so uh i I had to write the book quickly in order to kind of retain control to to retain the intellectual property rights over my own uh experience of abuse basically considering the events that took place and everything that you were subjected to it's really quite horrible to hear that you were put in that position once you were free of your perpetrator because it feels almost like you're trapped in another situation that that is impossible yeah so yeah i mean just to fill out for your listeners right part of what you're referencing is that what larry did which you know is very classic and a lot of um cult type coercive control experiences is you know he created these high pressure situations where he was making me and my friends question our memories. And uh, you could essentially say that he was rewriting our stories for us and telling the the stories back to us. And, and we, it was in some ways easier to believe him than it was to believe ourselves. It was certainly safer at the time to believe him. Um, Yeah. And then, and then I was in a situation where, um, other people wanted to kind of yeah do like what he did both like take control over my experience tell my story for me and exploit 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 me for money so um that's part of what felt so important both about the book and about this documentary which came about um kind of for similar reasons was i wanted to protect my friends you know from being from exiting like it's already hard enough to exit a cult how do you exit one into a world where everyone sees you as you know the subject of like a horror film right um that seemed like it would make life impossible for them and all i wanted was to make it more possible for them to leave and to make them safe when they did and i wanted to put survivors in the driver's seat of telling the story because it seemed like it's you know it's time to change how this is done and there's just enough of people who've gone through like the worst things you can imagine than going through like a secondary exploitation after it becomes public that is an interesting perspective because then I wonder how the Hulu team approached you and were able to assure you that the work they wanted to complete wouldn't be done in the way other journalists were attempting to do it before your publication. Yeah so I you know having written the book I approached Zach Heinzer Lang the director 
Um, yeah, I had conversations with a couple different directors. Um, and, you know, it was really clear that he wasn't someone who he didn't have a history of making true crime. It wasn't something he was really interested in. He, what he liked about reading the book I had written was the ways that I tried to approach this experience in a really like human way, you know, it's just to maybe bring people into what it feels like to be 18, to be 19, to meet someone who's your friend's dad, you know, and it's just a friend's dad at first and who seems really authoritative and, and the ways in which, you know, incrementally things get worse and worse and, and to try to also contain some of the things that are like a uh, beautiful and funny and confusing and all these things about being that age. And, you know, it was, so it felt like we shared kind of an ethos and he was willing to really make me a part of the process. And then we approached Hulu and it also became clear that the folks that we were going to work with at Hulu were like really compassionate and really interested in doing this the right way and not not making it salacious or titillating so it just felt like at every juncture I both got lucky in meeting like there are really decent people out there who care about doing this right um and you know I just tried to make every choice with that in mind that sounds ideal that that process and it's really great that it did work out that way because I've had the opportunity to preview the documentary and I my takeaway um which I I told the Hulu team when they asked for feedback was everything that you've said I do think that it was an educational documentary but I also believe that it was done sensitively and almost inquisitively as well and when I spoke to Zach it became clear that he genuinely was inquisitive about the entire situation um and seeing some of it unfold in real time is really powerful I felt every emotion watching that documentary and it felt really well-rounded which is what you'd hope for from a documentary that's depicting truth over salacious headlines and so that is a good opportunity to really dive into things and ask you the questions that I'm sure you've answered hundreds of times to this point. So I'm genuinely thankful that you're taking the time to answer these questions again on the Cult Vault podcast. Um, Could we start by discussing what your life was like before Sarah Lawrence College? Yeah, sure. So, you know, I, I think that I was a fairly typical teenager teenage boy you know um there was a lot that I didn't know and you know I came from the woods uh in New Jersey and fairly sheltered but kind of a conservative area and um I had always felt kind of different than the people around me where I grew up you know I I think that the there was only really one version of masculinity that was available um, you know, and it's the version that I think, sorry, this cat is going to really try to get. Okay, in. that's it's okay. So <laughs> it's, this isn't for me, it's for him. Um, uh, so uh, yeah, there was only this kind of one way to be a man. And um, I wasn't that, you know, um, and that always felt clear to me, um, but confusing. And then you know, I was drawn to the school, Sarah Lawrence, where, you know, as their slogan was, uh, you know, you're different, so are we. And um, it felt like a place where I might fit in with other people who didn't fit in, right? Um, and that was all true and great, but also because there was no structure, there were no kind of rules, really there was a lot of room to explore and it also felt really overwhelming. You know, I really was trying to figure out who I was and wanted to know how to be happy. You know, I had just been so um, unhappy as a teenager, as many teenagers are and didn't understand why. And, and um, then one day, 
you know, uh, well, I should say, so my friend Santos was one of my first friends at school, started dating someone named Talia Ray, uh, you know, kind of like his first serious relationship. Um, Talia was pretty different than the rest of us in that she was so focused, you know, in a school where people were pretty like artsy and doing their own thing. She was very serious. She didn't do small talk. It was just like philosophy and justice. And most of all, her dad, Larry Ray, um, who was in prison because he had been at the center of this conspiracy. He had been a Marine. He had been an international kind of intelligence agents, agent. He had done all of these amazing things and then had been unjustly imprisoned. This is all according to her. And it was like all she talked about. Um, and then in sophomore year, she kind of made it happen that we got group housing, which was just a way at Sarah Lawrence to have like a better housing situation if you all applied together. So um, she and a bunch of my other friends all put together this house um, called Slonum Woods 9, which we moved into sophomore year. And then she told us that her dad was getting out of jail and would it be okay if he, you know, used our couch or slept in like an air mattress in her room or whatever until he could get his feet back under him? Um, and, you know, there were like seven of us up in Ventalia and no one person was going to be the one who said, like, no, you can't be reunited with your dad, who is the only person you talk about. Um, so we kind of let it happen. And I mostly just tried to avoid him um and then things obviously escalated from there i don't know if this is a presumptuous question because mm -hmm. i'm aware that even though there has been a sentencing recently there are still co-conspirator trials that are due to take place and um, talia setting up the housing situation do you think at this point that that was intentional knowing that her father was going to want a place to stay well uh, yeah it's a great question so just to clarify the the situation so uh isabella who was talia's best friend at sir lawrence um and was kind of um if Talia was Larry's first victim, Isabella was his second, um, at least in this way, you know, because learned through Zach in the documentary that Larry victimized a lot of other people in different ways before he tried out this particular technique. Um, so Isabella pled guilty. She took a plea deal um, and her sentencing is going to happen in a couple of weeks. Um, Talia, Larry's daughter, was named as a co-conspirator, which I guess means that they could press charges if they wanted to, the prosecutors, but they have not. Um, and I haven't heard from either of them uh, since I left. Right. Okay. Thank you for thank you for that clarification. Um, I I don't know if this is a difficult question as well or whether it wouldn't be appropriate to answer on behalf of somebody else. Mm. But when I speak with Jan Jalalic and we, we have discussions together about family cults and one-on-one -on -one cults, do you believe that, that Talia was part of a one-on-one -on -one cult before the rest of you were introduced to Larry Ray? I think that would be fair to say. I mean, it's hard to diagnose anything. I'm not a professional but Larry is certainly a domineering, authoritative personality, totally self-obsessed and seemed really interested in making kind of a Xerox copy of himself and his daughter. And she spent her whole life from birth around him. He convinced her that her birth mother was abusive, um, separated her you know, supposedly by her own doing from her mom and her sister. Her whole life became about reuniting with her sister, but she was separated. They were separated on the basis of this supposed conspiracy that Larry had convinced her was true. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think by any definition, it would be right to say that she was in a one-on-one -on -one cult, yeah. 
So seven of you have moved in. There's yourself, there's Talia, there's Isabella. And who are the other four housemates that you have at this point? Um, so it's, yeah, it's Talia, Isabella, me, um, my friends, Santos, Claudia, uh, Gabe, Max, and Juliana. And it's a, a tightly knit but diverse group of individuals as depicted in the documentary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those were my friends, you know, these were like the people who I became friends with on the first day of going to university, you know, um, it's a special thing. And I think that people know what that feels like. And it's hard to imagine a group like that being sort of blown apart uh, the way that we were. You've mentioned that at Sarah Lawrence, everything was very laid back and everybody was just kind of chilling and experiencing new things and enjoying campus life. And I think that I recognize that experience from my days at university, especially my first year. And I also think that if somebody would have said to us in our seven person student accommodation, which I was in, you know, oh, my mum's going to come and stay. My dad's going to come and stay. My brother, my sister, you know, my best friend. I think, you know, I would have just been like, yeah, cool. And then, right. I, I, so I don't know how strange that would be for anyone listening who has experienced the first year of university, especially if you're moving away from home for that experience. Um, I can't imagine that that's too strange for anybody to consider. Yeah. And you have to remember, it's not that she said, is it okay if he comes and stays here for months? You know, it, there were, the terms were very vague. Larry was so good at just playing the edge of what was reasonable or acceptable. So it's like, he wouldn't stay every night, you know? So it wasn't like he was living there. You know, you couldn't quite call it that he was sort of in and out. And so it just was like, it lived in this gray area where it was very hard to identify what was going on or even to talk about it. But of course now years later, you look back on it and after all of the abuse and everything, it's very easy to say like, how could this possibly have happened? A lot of the comments that I've seen floating around on social media discuss and quite rightly as well, I, I think, how was this situation not picked up by the college itself? And I think there's the first issue. He wasn't there permanently or full time. Um, I and and I know that there's been sort of a vague statement that Sarah Lawrence have given in response to everything that happened. But if you as housemates are not questioning the presence of Larry Ray, it would it would be strange that the college itself would pick up on his presence within your student accommodation yeah that is true and you know I only learned later that some parents had flagged this for the school right. um, so I think there is a failure that you can point to on the part of the administration who were made aware of this to not at least look into it I think is yeah. a real um uh something really went wrong there and then as you see in the documentary I mean later on Larry was compelling us to kind of make all these confessions and in one case um, pushed Claudia to email like everyone in her life and sort of confess that she had been saying negative things about Larry Ray or spreading rumors about him which, of course, a lot of these people had never heard of Larry Ray. And now the first thing that they're hearing is this kind of really off the wall email. But on that email were a bunch of Sarah Lawrence professors and administrators. So, you know, people were seeing evidence that something was going on. And I think that, I mean, first of all, people who are working in university administration, I mean, no judgment, but it's maybe you're used to things being pretty straightforward and encountering a situation like this, you know, those people are not prepared 
to deal with it. They don't know at all what they're facing. Um, and they can't imagine, you know, that it would be as extreme as it was. I, I do think that in general, if there's anything that positive that could come from that aspect of the story, like exploitation like this is something that happens often on university campuses, whether it's, I mean, there are cults that literally recruit on college campuses, but also, you know, like Larry wasn't the only person who didn't go to the school who was living there. You know, I knew people who had like their older off-campus boyfriend living on campus and those weren't necessarily exploitative things, but people get into really unhealthy relationships and dynamics. And it would be really great if school administration were trained in how to help students kind of get back to themselves and question these types of relationships in their lives and lean on their support network and go to school counseling, all these things so that we're not just on our own with someone like Larry Ray. With those extra pieces of information, I think there's definitely like a safeguarding lapse and lack of responsibility and action from the college in that respect. You know, another reason that I felt it was important to speak about this and you know of course there are many other people who have been telling their stories about this type of coercive control and cult abuse it just seems to me that when people who are in a position to protect folks who are vulnerable in a situation like this uh, when they encounter this kind of thing it just feels impossible for them to imagine um, and I just think that you know clearly cults are real. They're a part of kind of the fabric of human experience. They're not some extreme, it, people treat them almost like they treat UFOs or something. It's like some unicorns. Imaginary... Yeah, totally. Like they only, like, they only know. kind of come around once every 10 or 20 years. Right, 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 right. And it only happens on the fringes of society. And, and I think somewhere in people's brains, they really think there hasn't been a cult since the seventies, even though they know that there are. So I think, you know, these things play on really regular human psychodynamics. It's not that dissimilar, as you know, from things people experience every day, you know, the types of pressures and power dynamics that come up in friend groups and in workplaces and in relationships. And we just need to start folding the cult experience a little bit more into the larger social discourse, the way that we have like domestic violence, you know, or, the, or sexual violence, like these these are real experiences that we have to look at head on, you know. I want to clip that and send that to every school in this country because I think it's imperative that we start introducing some type of of course or or some type of educational framework to younger people who might be able to recognize coercive control and what you've said there just encapsulates perfectly why it's needed um, and and how much trauma could be avoided if something like that existed for young people so that's our mm -hmm. yes that's our soapbox um soapbox quote for this episode and it was very eloquent so thank you very much for that okay. Daniel <laughs> <laughs> yeah no, thank you for the soapbox what was your first impression of Larry Ray when he arrived at Sloan and Woods 9 yeah so I think it might speak to sort of the power of a manipulator like this that the distance traveled between my first impression of him and then how I felt about him later when I was sort of fully in his thrall when I first encountered him you know he seems sort of silly if, if I'm honest like this kind of I don't want to just judge someone on their appearance but I'll make an exception in this one case you know is this sort of like small kind of bowling ball of a man and he just talked incessantly and, you know, he was just kind of like weird and also just like tiring. It just was like a lot to be around him and you could never get a word in. And I mostly, I just wanted to go hang out with my girlfriend or my friends. And it was like the second you came within 10 feet of him, he was going to try and pull you into a conversation. And there was never a moment of pause when you could say like, Hey, I've got a 
go. Like there wasn't enough time. So I would just try to avoid him at first. And you have mentioned there that at this point you're in a relationship, which I think is quite significant at the point where you have uh, in in the, the book, which is also really kind of well explored in the documentary as well, your first significant sit down with Larry Ray on a one-to-one basis in the coffee shop. So mm-hmm. I wondered if you could just talk the listeners through how you went from kind of being exhausted by him to having this one-on-one meeting with him in the coffee shop. Yeah, so I think that um, we all know these junctures in life in which you're more vulnerable and college is its own, you know, university is its own juncture. And then you go through a breakup and um, you're really sort of uh, open and um, sensitive and, I think that Larry saw that um, and it was pretty clear that he sent my friends Santos and Claudia to talk to me and kind of um, check in with how I was doing and if I might benefit from some help from Larry the way that they at that point had felt they were benefiting. So they were already very much, you know, they had been pulled into those conversations and they were, you know, he was ordering fancy takeout and uh, you know they were having these meals in the dorm summer came uh my relationship was getting challenging and i i couldn't quite figure out what to do and i also just wanted to have a summer where i lived in new york city you know i was going to school just outside the city i had no money everyone who was cool seemed to live in the city i didn't understand that they had like parents who were giving them money it's no one really tells you that it's the trick to living in new york um and so my friends came to me and said you know uh clearly like you need help with this relationship i I, you know i've been trying to find an apartment and they were like maybe you should just sit down and have coffee with larry and he can like help you out with these things because you know he'll like maybe he'll help you through like one of his friends find a place to stay and he can give you a relationship advice and I was like fine you know this seems harmless agreed to get coffee with him at a Starbucks on the Upper East Side and what you know what happened then was this conversation that um, I think anyone who's been in a cult is pretty familiar with this first conversation that feels not that long but then you look at the clock after and it's been six or seven eight hours you know we were there from the morning until the starbucks closed and i didn't even realize the time had been passing we'd been talking about yes my relationship and yeah my living situation but also my mom who'd been sick my whole life and how that might be sort of a part of these things and my concerns about masculinity and also my sexuality and questions and fears that I had like written in my diary but would never have said to anyone and that felt so validating just to say out loud to another human being Um, except unlike a therapist who might have just listened you know and let me process Larry offered really definitive black and white answers to these real sort of gray area questions. You know, he was, he told me, you know, I see you, you're really smart and really special and have all of these, you know, things that make you really capable. And you're a man. You just need to learn how to like be a man and you're not gay, you know, so that's simple and you don't have to feel embarrassed about your body it's totally fine and like normal and you're attractive and all you know it's just like everything I needed to hear and um not that like half of that wasn't true you know it's like uh, I think there was no room for fluidity um in Larry's worldview and it, it turns out the reality both about being a person and about my particular experience of gender and sexuality is like much more fluid 
I I I felt that that Larry Ray in his regimented way is very much working in female male gender conformity um mm-hmm. strictly and i think that 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 came across very much so in in both your writing and the documentary itself um and i think that it's important to mention as well to the listeners um that when Larry Ray first came to Sloan and Woods 9, he was, after a while, um, taking on a parental role model figure amongst the uh, cohort itself. So the, the fancy takeouts, but but the long conversations and the support and the jokes and the humor and the comfortability and lounging around in pajamas and just kind of being like, oh, hey, everybody. And... Uh, of course, on reflection, that's most likely intentional on his part to make everybody feel comfortable and secure enough in his presence that he can, you know, start to change and manipulate things. But almost with this interaction in the coffee shop, it, it feels like it could have been a, a kind of parent-child situation as well. Did did it feel like he could have been a, like a parental figure for you at that point? Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, You know, we had all left home for the first time and you're at school alone. And what does a parent do for you generally? Like they make you meals and they're the person that you can go to to talk to when you have sort of personal things you're trying to work out. And more or less, that's what Larry that's the position he installed himself into. And yeah, I didn't know going into that conversation that he was going to try to sort of uh, supplant the role of my father, but yeah, absolutely. That's what he did. Well, it's just really uncomfortable to like think about and talk about. And I imagine that it must be that way for you as well. Um, Even after talking about it so much, um, there was a quote that I picked out from your book that is a quote uh, from Larry Ray. Would you mind if I read it or or would that make you uncomfortable? Oh, no, please go ahead. So it says in Sloan and Woods 9, your memoir, trust me, I'm professionally trained to to evaluate people to walk around the inside of their minds. It's easy for me. And I'd like to use that to help you. Is that all right? So that's one of the first things that he says to you in regards to mind manipulation, but also prefaces it as though he's doing you a favor. Um, And this is in the coffee shop that he says this to you. And it's almost like foreshadowing because what he says he can do in this sentence is exactly what he did to everybody um what is it like writing a book where you are recalling those conversations and realizing that that is what eventually played out wow well you know when you go through an experience like this it's hard enough to even start allowing yourself to uh, remember it, you know, to look at it. And then to figure out what to call what happened to you, to give it a name or to start to imagine that other people might have experienced similar things, that it's not just this thing that happened to you, but that you could call it a cult, you could call it sexual abuse or you know, rape. Um, And still, you know, even then for years after I started to have some language for it, I lived inside of it, you know, it was all around me. And I wasn't, you know, I was letting the people closest to me know that this thing had happened, but there were so many people in my life who didn't know anything about this huge defining experience I had had. 
and I didn't think of it as extreme either, you know, um, I just thought of it as like, wow, that situation with my friend's dad really went pretty bad. Um, and when I started to write it and kind of put it into some order, you know, it felt the way that sometimes it feels when you look back on like journal entries, if you keep a journal and and you see, yeah, here's these patterns that have been there for a long time. Or, oh, I was saying that thing that I thought was sort of a new feeling like years ago. And you start to see it all. And and most of all, it allowed me to step outside of it. I, I was really surprised by the, the feeling of having written the book. Um, in some ways, it's like I outsourced my memory to the book. And so now my memory lives in that, those 272 pages, you know, um, and it's not something that I, I mean, it's still in me, but I don't have to, it's not like this color that's blended with every single thing in my life in the same way. So that's pretty profound. And a very beautiful way of wording it as well. Um, you you have a a very a very um you ha you have a talent for the vernacular i would say <laughs> thank you and um what i thought was strange about your conclusion in the coffee shop was that you left with larry ray and then when you turned the corner there's a stretch limo waiting for you with the 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 others waiting inside yeah what is with the limo is that typical <laughs> was that the first time you'd seen the limo i feel like i i need a bit more of an explanation on totally. why he chauffeured himself and everyone around in a limo yeah it's a great question i'm happy to provide more information so i think that part of what larry did and a lot of these types of abusers do is they made he made everything so absurd that you wouldn't even know how to begin to tell someone else about it. So that's what made this feel so hard at the beginning was I was like, how if I'm gonna explain this to anyone, I have to explain all of it and and I have to make the limo make sense. So yeah, we stepped out of this coffee shop. I was disoriented after hours of having like the first conversation in my life where I, I told another human being, like, maybe I, I'm i afraid I might be gay. Like, I'm worried about the size of my penis. Like, these are things that like no one talks about to anyone. And I, we walked and we were, and this was like, finally in the conversation, he says to me, and also as a sort of postscript, you should break up with your girlfriend and you should come and stay with me and and your friends are staying with me at this apartment and i round the corner and then there's this limousine the stretch limo waiting there and the door opens and i really distinctly remember you know it was night by then and like the light spilling out of the limo and then inside there's all my friends and it didn't sort of cross my mind at the time but what i what i would realize later is that something that characterized so much of my time with Larry Ray was just waiting, just waiting for him, sitting in a car, sitting in a living room. If you moved, if you did something else for yourself, it would be perceived as some kind of betrayal or working against him somehow. So all my friends for the entire time, from when that Starbucks opened to when it closed and Larry and I were talking inside of it, they were all just sitting in that limousine waiting the whole time. And that to me is almost like the most insidious thing. And I would find myself in that position often. I, I think that what the limousine signified was Larry Ray was flexing status to make us feel um, like he had a kind of power, like he had a kind of legitimacy. And also he would sort of wave around this idea that we could achieve the kind of like wealth and you know this was a lifestyle that he was used to and the only reason that he didn't have it was at first because he'd been a prison in prison and then later he said because we were sabotaging him and causing all these problems but soon you know one day we would get to the life where you know limousines would be a regular part of our existence 
far did you travel in the limo? Did it just take you back to the Upper East Side, or or what? what how? Or, and how far away was that? A limo to me is like, you know, like prom. I'm going to go yeah. to prom in a limo, or you're going to arrive to your wedding in a limo. It just seemed so out of left field, and in in the grand scheme of things, it really wasn't. But um, strange to see that limo in the documentary. Yeah, I think these were all, you know, Sarah Lawrence is an expensive school and he chose all um, victims who I, I think all of us were there on some kind of scholarship who were kind of out of place and who weren't used to this kind of like glamour and maybe you have these ideas of what fancy wealthy people do. So it's like this kind of cartoon idea of wealth as you take a stretch limo, you know, two blocks from the Starbucks to the apartment, or in that case, I think he took us in the limo downtown and we had like dinner, but it was just sort of, especially in the beginning for me and for all of us, you know, the love bombing and the lavishing us and making us feel like this, you know, could be this like beautiful existence and, you know, and then things turn uh, dark. So between your meeting in the coffee shop and um, your full integration into the apartment on the Upper East Side, how did things change in that period of time? Uh, we see kind of an escalation in behavior at this point. Once, once you're all separated from family and loved ones and isolated, I feel this is really where Larry Ray begins to implement um, a self-sealing system that's impossible almost to break out of. Yeah, really well said. Um, yeah, he really quickly... You know, I got to see what was happening on the inside of these conversations that I'd been seeing my friends have from the outside um, since we were at school. And, um, you know, initially he was playing us music or having us taste food and then sort of telling us about these subtle layers of meaning or flavor or whatever that we kind of couldn't sense, but he could. And, and that if we sort of stuck with him, we'd be able to experience the full range of like what's possible with the mind um you know which was an appealing concept and already kind of when you're going to college all you're trying to do is become like a more full person so he just was kind of proposing a real like, adult <laughs> yeah yeah exactly it's like this must be what it is you learn you know I don't know how to understand songs better uh and then very quickly early he um you know, I was sleeping on the couch in that living room. It, this kind of inversion from what he'd been doing in our dorm. I thought I was just crashing there until I found another place to live in the city. You know, it's temporary. Santos uh, and Claudia, their parents both lived uh, in New York. So they went back home. So sleeping there alone. And then Isabella came out of the bedroom where she slept and I think in retrospect, it feels pretty clear that Larry sent her out um, and she performed uh, oral sex on me. And that was like my first experience with, you know, your mind slowing down, feeling like time's kind of freezing, like you don't want what's happening, but it's happening. Um, and also feeling this pressure of masculinity and like I should you know, this is the kind of thing that like guys want um, and then just hoping it would be over. And then it was. And that was kind of the first step in what would be Larry's supposed like sexual education of me. And I think using me and Isabella kind of against each other. Um, uh, yeah. And, and that was a part of this larger system, what you call this self-sealing system, which I think is really smart. Um that Not my term, Yanya cool. Lalich again, that one. <laughs> oh, it's good, it's good. Yeah, but, you know, using shame and guilt and fear, especially as it escalated into physical violence later, um, to make it feel impossible to break out, yeah. There's a lot of other things that play a part as well in terms of um, conformity 
and social proofing. So when the public shaming starts, um, Larry Ray starts accusing people of doing things that probably never happened, like you scratching one of his favorite pans, for example, mm -hmm. um, or damaging his new oven, uh, which you'd never seen up to that point, funnily enough. Um, and others are immediately on side with Larry Ray, uh, telling whoever is being accused of damaging property to apologize, to earn your, to earn his trust back or to pay him back through some type of service or another. Um, that social proofing as well, it, it only reinforces your cognitive dissonance where you're thinking, I know I didn't damage that, but if everybody's telling me I did, then maybe I, I did and I just don't remember. And mm -hmm. that is, again, such a complicated and almost impossible situation. Um, and it goes back to what you were saying earlier about how Larry Ray almost had the ability to change your memories and recollections of things um, to, to mm -hmm. skew them or warp them in, into becoming something that they were probably not anything like to begin with um and it's suffocating to read those parts of the book it's 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 i felt like i couldn't breathe and i imagine that's how you felt as well um as as it it became more and more extreme and intense yeah the what he preyed on was decency um like etiquette you know the basic things that we learn and don't realize that we've learned where, you know, when you're waiting for a pause in conversation to jump in and say something, and, you know, that's the decent thing to do. We don't interrupt each other. And I just waited for a pause for like two years and it never came, you know. Um, the thing, when I'm saying he like preyed on decency, I think what I'm getting at is when you mentioned the scratching of the pan and the social proofing, I think that if you you watch your friends not only say that you did this thing, but also you watch them be accused of doing similar things and then them admit it and say, you know what, I actually did. It was true all along. That also reinforces you're like, well, if they could have done this thing and not remembered it at first, maybe it's possible to not remember something, but you did it. And then if you believe that even a little bit, like if you let yourself believe maybe this guy who's putting me up in his house and is cooking me meals is, is right when he says that I broke his stuff. If I left, like I broke someone's stuff who had just been sort of like paying my rent essentially. And then I just ran off. Like what a terrible thing to do. So, I, you know, it's like, I'm a decent person. I'm not going to just leave the situation. I'm going to try and make it up to him, you know, and that is such a trap. And, and yes, then you start to let yourself accept things like you can't really ever go to the bathroom or if you do you feel like you're sneaking in there for five minutes and you know and then you get in trouble anyway when you come out you know so yeah. earlier you mentioned that larry ray was always really good at skirting around the edges of what was reasonable and what we see so often with all cult leaders is the ability to push what is reasonable a little bit further away from what you would typically accept and what the abuser is trying to accomplish um and i think that's what your book and what stolen youth the hulu documentary does so well in depicting that slow kind of frog frog in the saucepan analogy in the boiling water analogy it it it, it happens so gradually over time mm -hmm. to the point where the kind of father son type of relationship becomes you so infantilized by the dependency that has been created by larry ray that you have this crippling moment in the book where you're like i need to shower but I can't shower because I need Larry to come and tell me that I can shower but what if I go to shower and he 
finds me in the shower and then I get, you know, shamed and whatever horrible consequences he decides to inflict. And that is crippling. And Mm -hmm. it begins to extend into every part of your life. Were you recognizing these patterns with everybody else as well? Or was this a disconnect from your reality before Larry Ray came into your life? Yeah, that's part of what's so difficult. Uh, what makes it so difficult to escape this situation is that you kind of can't test how you're feeling against anyone else. It's like, it's the essence of anxiety, that paralysis, you know, you wonder, well, if I do this, maybe this will happen. And if I do this, this will happen. I can't do this. And and everything is based off of not whether you will feel good or bad about what you did, but whether this other person will approve or disapprove and hurt you. Um, there was no way, you know, I've talked to other survivors of Larry since and I think we've all had fantasies about like, I wish that I could go back there and and if I could sort of be there and just turn to you and say like, do you think this is weird or is this like bad or is that just me, you know? But there, I couldn't, everyone was surviving in their own way. And just like me, everyone was trying their best to hide that they might be feeling pain or fear because those would become reasons for more harm. So you look at your friends and they seem totally fine and it doesn't match what you're feeling internally. So it feeds into that assumption that it must be that something's wrong with me, that I'm broken in the way that my abuser is saying I'm broken and I need to just keep going with this program so that I can be better like them. With the time spent in the apartment in New York, what other measures were being put in place during this time that that contributed to that insular environment because I know that a lot of media outlets have labeled the Sarah Lawrence cult as a sex cult I don't agree that that's necessarily anywhere near accurate um so I just wonder if you could talk the listeners through those other methods of coercive control that were in place at this time totally so yeah i think it might be more accurate to call it a therapy cult um but you know again i'm I'm really not a professional um so a few things right the the basics of uh convincing each of us that our closest supports our families our friends uh wanted uh, nothing good for us or that in fact our you know families in the past had harmed us in some way that Larry was the person sort of rescuing us from this harm and reminding us of it so sort of separating everyone from their support network um, and then the shape of this was essentially it's constant sleep deprivation so you're sleeping maybe a couple hours a night we're constantly trying to work to help Larry, but the work is mostly sitting around and waiting for him to like come out of a room and tell us what to do. And by then it's like midnight and we try to do something that, you know, clean up or organize because at this point we're also living in what's essentially like a hoarder's apartment. So just like mountains of stuff everywhere. So like a totally chaotic environment, sleep deprived. And then, you know, something happens or it doesn't happen. Either someone does like drop something or break something or more often Larry just claims something happened. He can see a look on someone's face. Someone cut their hair differently, whatever. And now we have to all sit down in a circle and this person's in, it's a hot seat situation and Larry's going to interrogate them. He's going to prompt us to also ask them questions this is going to go on for hours until they have what Larry considers to be a breakthrough, um, you know, about some kind of family abuse, something like that. And they admit that, yes, you know, I did scratch your pan and I did it on purpose because I'm resisting your help, you know, because I don't want to deal with this thing. 
and then you're sort of rewarded um, for that breakthrough. Um, and by then it's like sunrise. And once again, it's everyone's fault for sabotaging Larry and making him take all this time helping us and rinse and repeat. There was a lot of control around your diet and your clothing um, and your expectations on on finance as well uh in terms of larry kind of larry ray made everybody feel like he was going to financially take care of people but then when it suited him he would make a point of saying that that's not the case um so i wondered if you could just talk the listeners through the restrictions or the expectations that were placed on you as a group in terms of how you were supposed to act, music you were supposed to listen to, books, color of clothing, um, and and on all of those really minuscule details that he controlled. Yeah. I okay. So there's a few different things there. I think the like the class control, the financial control aspect is something that hasn't been talked about a lot in relation to this. And it, it's hard to express the feeling of you know not having money and someone else has money and it feels like they have authority and know better than you and you know a, a story I tell in the book that I think kind of demonstrates this feeling early on is like it was my birthday that summer or or was it even for my birthday maybe it was for Talia's birthday we went out to some dinner and Larry told me to pick a wine and I wasn't used to like fancy menus that don't tell you how much the wine costs. And, you know, I picked a wine called flowers cause I thought it was sounded nice and didn't know anything. And then at the end of the meal, you know, the bill came back and it turned out I had ordered like a $75 bottle of wine. I worked in an ice cream shop downtown and was like a van driver during the year. You know, I had no money and what had been, you know, Larry had been like, you pick the wine and he was paying for everything. And now suddenly he was like, how are you going to pay for this? Because, you know, I didn't sign up to pay for a $75 bottle of wine. And I like panicked and wanted to figure out what I was going to do. And he kind of was like, well, I guess you could wash dishes in the restaurant, something like that. And, you know, it suddenly felt like I owed this thing back to him and then it was all a joke and he was like no of course I've got you like it's no problem and it's like this relief like thank god he helped me out of the situation that of course he had created and so that's kind of like the whole thing over and over is he would put you in a situation where suddenly you felt like you owed money because you'd done something wrong even though you didn't know quite how you'd done it wrong and then he was going to like help you out of it somehow um so that the the financial control part was really insidious. Yeah, yeah. Larry essentially tried to make us, I think, in his image, you know. Um, so he compelled us to dress the way he dressed, which was like uh, for the, the men, it was like khaki pants and brightly colored polo colored shirts and shaved head, you know. Um, so, uh, yeah. He he bought me these like clown colored running shoes at a certain point that I was supposed to wear. It was all like supposed to be about being this like confident man. He had this kind of confused views where he was like a man who's really comfortable in his masculinity wears bright colored clothes. He would wear pink all the time, like this badge of like, but it was kind of, he had like twisted it into being like this kind of aggressive thing. Um so yeah, we wore we wore what he wanted us to wear. We listened to the music that, you know, he made a playlist that uh he played every morning that, you know, I woke up to every morning. It's like it's like a hundred songs all in the same order. And it was like just a lot of like uh, music from the sixties and seventies. And uh, yeah, I think that if you're sleep deprived and you're waking up and like Alice in Chains is being played early in the morning, like that's going to break you slowly. <laughs> yeah. Do you ever experience hearing any of the songs from that playlist in public and it kind of take you back to those, those mornings? Yeah. I was just with a friend the other day uh, who was just reading my book and um, 
the Bill Withers song Lovely Day came on. And that was the first, I think it was the first, or it was one of the first songs on the playlist. Um, and hearing Bill Withers say like, it's going to be a lovely day over and over in this apartment in Manhattan where you're like surrounded by tools and chaos and you're getting abused every day. It was just like a horrific irony. And my friend <laughs> turned to me and was like, oh, the song's in your book. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I know um it sure is yeah and when I left when I was leaving you know I think that Larry knew on some level that I was leaving for good and wanted to make it look to everyone else like I was kind of failing out or something in a way that would allow him to maintain control over everyone else and he said to me you know how are you ever going to listen to any of these songs again um like that level of self-awareness and I was like I don't know I you know I I don't care and you know what I don't like it's fine I um they're they weren't my favorite songs to begin with I'd be sad if he like stole songs that I love it just turns out that his music taste was like kind of just like uh, basic and exhausting like you know who needs to hear Bob O'Reilly ever again Interestingly enough, a lot of these cult leaders turn out to just be pretty, pretty typical people uh, with n- mm-hmm. nothing special or or notable about them, really. Um, and I think that that's kind of ironic at the end of everything when they put themselves on these pedestals um, and eventually are seen for what they truly are, which is, I think, just cowardly um and 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 quite sad really yeah um so so yeah. you mentioned at, towards the start of our conversation that Talia Ray had talked about her father being this amazing man uh, who had accomplished all of these things and had all of these talents um when i first started watching the documentary i thought it was going to come to light that none of these things that he claimed to have done were true and that it was all made up and he was just a a con man through and through for everything he ever claimed what parts of Larry Ray's history were true um and what parts of it were completely fabricated yeah so I think that part of what was so disorienting about being near to Larry Ray was that process of trying to figure out what's real and what's false. Um, You know, I spent the whole time I was there trying to figure out what was actually going on. And I thought that once I knew I'd be able to decide, you know, if what he's saying is true, then I'll stay. And if I understand that it's all false, then I'll leave. And it's just that like power of logic. It's just a trap, you know, it's this maze that is built around you, I think very intentionally to be, impossible to exit i think that he was someone who like a lot of con men would sort of leverage relationships to achieve credibility so you know it seems like he did meet gorbachev you know there was a photo i started to doubt things and he showed me a photo of him with gorbachev and then i wondered maybe that's photoshopped or something and then he showed me a photo of him with george hw bush you know and that's really hard to make sense of but i don't think we really need to make sense of it like it's it's pretty possible it turns out to get in the room with powerful people if you kind of work your connections and relationships and if you're someone like larry ray who has no other priorities than status and power and that's his means of survival so it's just you know all of his attention was directed towards achieving the kind of life story where he could tell someone these things that had happened to him. He could sort of manipulate and goose the truth a little bit, and it would make him seem like this extraordinary figure and he'd have the receipts. But of course, it's all just sort of a, it's a smokescreen. So your story, well, everybody's story is very different from one another. Um, you're all very intellectual individuals, which I think is another important thing to highlight because there's a misconception on the type of person that joins a cult. Um, 
especially considering that some people are born and raised in groups and have no yeah. kind of predetermined social uh, standing or social yeah um i'll re reword that um and you are the first person to walk away from larry ray mm -hmm. um and it's a while before you have the chance to connect with anybody else that's made that decision as well so i wondered if you could briefly uh, just tell the listeners how when and why you left um and then all the places that everyone can find your book. <laughs> <laughs> so nice. Yeah. So, you know, the, the, I think there were a lot of things that made leaving so hard. And one of, one of the hardest things was the idea of leaving my friends behind in that situation. And what I hoped, I, I, I really believed, you know, it's like, if I could leave, first of all, this is so crazy. It can't be sustainable. Surely it'll all fall apart, you know, and I would fantasize about going back and saving them. I left, I think, you know, obviously it wasn't just one incident, but over time, it seemed like Larry was testing how far he could push things. And he just happened to test that on me at the time. And, um, you know, I don't know how much detail I need to go into but you know, there's these are in the book and I think they're mentioned in the documentary where he like tied a, a what he called a garrote around my groin and he was like torturing me that way in front of my friends he put me in a dress and made me try to swallow a dildo like all these things that super dehumanizing um and it started to just feel like uh I'm choosing between this situation which is supposedly making me better and my survival. Um, and, you know, at a certain point, I just was like, I I did some reality testing. I kind of was like, I think that he either is lying or doesn't know what's going on, but it kind of just, none of that matters. I just need to go. And I'm saying that as if it was very conscious, but it became much more about like, I don't need to think about things so much. Like all of this has been getting trapped by like trying to figure things out. I just am going to trust this feeling in my body that I want to do anything else. And I just, I just followed that. Um, and then, you know, six years passed where I told barely anyone, I felt like a ghost, you know, and I grieved my friends who I thought I would never talk to again. And then I got approached by reporters who said that they were telling a story about my, um, they had found out about my friend Claudia, who was supposedly poisoning people. They had heard something about that. And I, they showed me this website that had been published about her that said that she was poisoning people. And I was like, okay, we have to have a long conversation about what's actually going on here because someone is telling her to say these things. And that began this very long process where I finally got, you know, I, I Larry was still out in the world doing all these things, still hurting my friends. And I, I had been hiding from him for years, afraid that he would show up. And it finally was this moment where it felt like I could speak in a way that might overwhelm any attempts he might make to hurt me or to harm my reputation or something. And, um, so I did. And now, you know, he's in prison for the next 60 years. That happened like two weeks ago. I, you know, got to make a statement at his sentencing. And for, the, you know, after so many years of having to sit and listen to Larry Ray and never be able to interrupt, he had to sit and listen to me say what I wanted to say to him. Um, and I got to watch my friends, you know, be reunited with their families and with each other. And I get to go out to coffee with them and we can like laugh in, not just about like life but about like the things in this experience that were so crazy and so absurd and uh, everyone's safe you know for for the most part everyone's safe and that's this dream that like so few people get you know to to say all of that so um i feel incredibly incredibly lucky um to be where i am now and and my book is everywhere that books are. You know, you can get it on Amazon and Audible and 
on the penguin random house website and I hope you like it. (laughs) It's an incredible book. It's so, so well written. And the narrator for the audio book did a stellar job at all the different voices. Um, and, uh, his, his Larry Ray voice was, uh, uh, you know, quite intimidating as well. So it's an excellent audio book. Um, and I will make sure that I put links in the episode description to all the places that people can find your writing and also the, the Hulu documentary stolen youth inside the cult at Sarah Lawrence is coming exclusively to Hulu on February the 9th. I'm hoping that this episode will be out before then. And I just wanted to take a minute to say that I'm so thankful for our conversation today. And also that Larry Ray was arrested before anybody died, because I do believe that there was serious potential in this situation for uh, loss of life, especially considering that he was trying to convince all of you that you all wanted to end your lives in the first place. Um, I guess that's kind of where your label of of potentially a therapy cult would have played a part. Um, it's 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 astonishing, really, on 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 the face of everything that nobody was seriously injured or or did lose their life uh during his kind well, of reign of terror i do want to say that the oh one sorry after... yeah of course no no that's so fine i mean a- after he was arrested aban goikachea who had actually been a marine who was talia's ex-boyfriend before santos um he committed suicide um and, and i mean i could theorize about all the reasons i do think that trying to integrate you know he spent more years than any of us except for talia like at larry's side supporting him and and then also had ptsd from being in the military and i think it was probably just too much um but he that wasn't really included in the prosecution's charges against larry um but yeah i just i don't want to it's easy to forget a bond you know I, I think so as well. And I, I do want to just take a minute to apologize for that. I guess it's because um, the the book mentions him a lot, although he was not a member of your cohort in the student housing. Um, and I right. think that that might be where the, dis- where, where that, um, where I've distinguished that from. So I do want to apologize and, um, Iban's name should be should be absolutely remembered. So thank you for that, Daniel, um, and for your writing, and for speaking out, and for taking back your power, and for having all of these really lengthy conversations with people that uh, want to understand the subject of cults more, and want to have these in depth conversations with people that have experienced these things firsthand. I appreciate you. I appreciate your time, and I'm so excited for everyone to check out the documentary and let us know what they think so thank you thank you so much daniel enjoy the rest of your day thank you so much casey you too take care bye